focus on what you don't have. If you are carnal and only looking in the physical realm, you should be depressed. If you're in the natural and aren't depressed, you aren't paying attention. I guarantee you, just in the natural realm, there's a lot of problems going on. There's a lot of things bad. There's lots of reasons to be depressed. Your emotions follow what you think on. And if you're depressed, it's because you are looking in the physical, natural realm. You're evaluating things only based on the physical. You aren't thinking spiritually. You aren't seeing who you are in Christ. If you see who you are in Christ and that you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and if you see all of these things that you have, it's impossible to be depressed thinking about all that God has done for you and who you are. It's incompatible. Somebody says, but I'm, I'm hungry and I need this. Well, you can either look at your physical things or if worse comes to worse, I believe God wants to bless us in this physical life and see those things manifest. But if nothing ever happened and if you died in heaven, you're going to be provided in such luxury. You're going to live in a mansion. You're going to have streets that are paved with pure gold. So even if you weren't seeing physical manifestation of your things right now, you could just start thinking about heaven and you could rejoice thinking, Father, it's only temporary. If you were thinking spiritually, again, it's God's will for you to be well. But if you weren't well and if the doctor told you you were going to die, I believe God wants us to see that healing here. But if it never happened, you're going to go to heaven where you'll never be sick. You'll have no more sorrow. You'll have no more pain. And if you were thinking about that, you know, we sing this song about when we all get to heaven. What a day that's going to be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you cry. <laughs> that makes you think it was kind of just religious, amen. It wasn't real from your heart. If you were thinking like Paul where he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is even better. I'm having a struggle because I want to go to heaven so much, but it's more needful for me to stay here for you, so I'm going to stay. If you had that right attitude and if you were thinking scripturally, when the doctor tells you you're going to die, it would be just like all you could do to keep, up, keep from reaching up and kissing him. Awesome! Man, for me to die is Christ. That's awesome. It's great. See, that's spiritually minded. So I'm not denying that we have problems, but I'm saying if you evaluated your problems not only looking at the physical and looking at the doctor's report and the banker's report and all of these kind of things, but if you looked at God's report and what He's promised you, what you have in Christ is so much greater than any problem that you could ever have come against you that it's not even worthy to compare. That's what it says in Romans 8, 17. It's either 17 or 18. The sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It didn't say the glory that shall be revealed to us, but the glory that shall be revealed in us. We sing these songs when we all get to heaven and we think that God is just going to somehow or another give us something and we will be so awesome when we get to heaven. Did you know that your spirit is right this moment identical to the way it will be throughout eternity? Your spirit's not going to be improved. It's not going to be given another dose of the Holy Ghost. It's not going to be matured. You don't have a baby spirit on the inside of you and then in heaven you'll have a full spirit. Your spirit is full grown. It's not the spirit part of you that's growing. It's the carnal part of you, your mind that is growing and being renewed. But in the spirit, you're identical to Jesus. You're as full grown as Jesus. As much faith, joy, peace, and anointing as Jesus. Your spirit right now is exactly the way it will be a million years from tonight in eternity. And the rest of the Christian life is renewing your mind to what you've already got. Not trying to get God to give you something new. And if you understood this, it will solve a lot of problems. It will keep you away from people who manipulate and control. So much of religion is based on you come and do what I say, and then God will give you this. If you understood that God's already given you everything, then you'd quit giving in to these manipulations and controls. You know, I just got through teaching on finances on television. Some of you might have seen that. 
And it was interesting, our response. Lots of people got mad at me because they just, they have a chip on their shoulder anytime a minister talks about finances. And some of that's well deserved because ministers have done so many bad things to manipulate and control. But I also begin to expose manipulation. And I taught that you give where you're fed, not where you're begged. And I begin to teach on things like this. And see, there's, there's people that responded to us and told about either themselves or a relative or somebody who at one time gave $1,000 because it was told that if you do this, your relatives will be saved. This will happen. And they gave and they found out it didn't happen and they turned away from God and all of these kind of things. And we heard many stories of people who had been hurt and manipulated by this. See, if you understood that you've already got everything in Christ and you've already got this power and we aren't in the process of begging God to touch people. God loves your relatives more than you love them. God wants them saved more than you want them saved. You don't have to do something to get God motivated to, do, to touch them. I had a woman come to me one time and she says, I've been praying for my husband for 20 years and he's still just as bad as he ever was. My prayers don't work. Maybe if you would pray, God would do something and heal my husband. And you know what I said? I refuse to pray with you under those circumstances. And she just looked at me and I said, Boy, you, first of all, are accusing God that He doesn't love your husband as much as you do. And so you've got to get him motivated to love your husband and to save him. I said, you started completely wrong right there, thinking that God's not going to do anything. God would just let him go to hell if it wasn't for your prayer and intercession. I said, that's a bad attitude. And then to think that somehow or another it's according to our ability and, and maybe I'm closer to God and so I have more pull with God than you do. I said, that's another error. And I just begin to counter this lady's doctrine and I said I'm not going to agree with you that's the reason that you haven't seen anything happen it's because you're believing wrong you're doing this all wrong quiet in this Presbyterian church some of you are thinking man that's the way I've been praying see that's that's the reason that we can be manipulating people say if you'll send in this thousand dollar offering then God is going to move and do this you can buy it. That's what the Catholic Church used to do in the Middle Ages with indulgences. They made billions of dollars off of praying people out of purgatory, which doesn't even exist. They manipulated people, and you can get God to do this. You stop charlatans when you start understanding that I've already got it. And just because you've already got it in your spirit, you don't need to be satisfied to keep it there. You need to learn the Word so that you can start drawing it out and experience these blessings in your physical body and in your physical world. And so, yes, there are things we need to learn, but boy, it changes everything when you understand that God has already done His part. He's already placed it. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Not some, all. You've already got it. If you don't have it manifest, if you can't see it, put your finger on it, it's not because God didn't give it, it's because you hadn't received it yet. So one of the first steps is quit trying and start trusting. You need to rest in what God has already done instead of fighting to get God to do something. You know, if... If that synthesizer over there is healing, and I'm not there yet, I'm sick, but I'm going to be healed, well then, there's an element of doubt in that. Even though that's not a real far distance, there's no guarantee that I can cover that distance. Somebody might come up here and tackle me. I might trip and fall. There could be something that keeps me from getting there. But if here is healing, how can I doubt that I'll get where I already am? I've already got I'm already here. I have zero doubt that I can get here because I'm already here. If you'd quit saying instead, I'm going to be healed and say, by His stripes I was healed. I have the same power on the inside of me that raised Christ from the dead. Then you'd quit doubting that you would get what you've already got. That changes everything. 
Isn't that awesome? I'm not making much progress on this, but look down here in the same chapter. He starts praying a prayer in verse 14. And, um, or excuse me, it's verse 15. I'm not going to take time to read this because every word of this is powerful. I have preached on this for hours and hours and hours on the end and I've got ten minutes left. So let me just skip through some of the highlights. He's praying not that you would get something special, but he's praying rather that God would give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in what you've already got. That you'd see what you've already got. The exceeding greatness of His power towards us. And so here's part of this prayer in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. It's not in heaven. It's in you already. He's praying, God, show them the riches of the glory. Some of you think, I don't have any glory on the inside of me. Again, Romans chapter 8, either verse 17 or 18 says, The sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's already in you. You have the same glory that Jesus has seated on the throne, living on the inside of you. It's glorious what you have. He's praying that you get your eyes open to the riches of the glory. Man, that's awesome. If you could truly see what you have, it would be impossible for you to be depressed, discouraged, Woo! fearful. But most of us, oh well, maybe I had that at one time, but you don't know I've done something wrong and we think it comes and goes. Who you are in the Spirit is a constant. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit and it never fluctuates. And your sin and failures, they penetrate into your physical body and into your soulish mental realm but it does not penetrate your spirit. Your spirit is sealed and it remains righteous and truly holy and it's glorious and you have all of this power and glory of God living on the inside of you. He's praying that you get a revelation of it. And then in verse 19, and He wants you to see what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. He's praying, God, show them the power that they have, the exceeding greatness of this power. How much is it? It's the same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. Not just a little bit above Satan. It's a close contest, but in a pinch Jesus would win. No, it's far above all principality and power. That's the power that you have on the inside of you. I have so many people come to me and they try and make themselves as pathetic and pitiful as they possibly can so that I'll have pity on them. And they just, oh, my situation is so bad. I hurt so much. I, and I'm, you know, some people get upset at me. I'm not, I'm not making fun of people. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to amplify how wrong that attitude is. But there are people that delight in being pitiful and letting everybody know how pitiful they are because they get sympathy and pity and they're searching for help. And they come and they said, would you please agree with me? And I tell them, no, I'm not going to agree with you because you are absolutely pitiful. <laughs> you are claiming that you have no power. I said, I have compassion for you, but I do not sit there and feel sorry for you when you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Christ from the dead. I'm not going to get into agreement with you and start thinking like you or nobody's going to help you. You need to come over to my way of thinking. You need to come and agree with me. I'm not going to agree with you. You need to start seeing that who you are in Christ and that you have all of this power. You have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That's more than enough to heal your hangnail. That's more than enough for your cold, for your rheumatoid, arthritis, for whatever. Whatever you're facing is nothing compared to the power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead. And you've already got that power living on the inside of you. And I know that there's some people sitting right here saying, I don't have it. That's because you're only searching the physical realm. You don't feel it. 
You don't have a goosebump going up and down your spine. You can't feel it with your five senses. But I'm telling you, in your spirit, you have the same amount and quality of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You got raising from the dead power on the inside of you. Somebody says, well, if I got it, how come it's not doing anything? Because you don't know you've got it and you don't believe it. Your mind basically it empowers whatever you think about. Even though, you have, even though you've been born again and you have this, if you don't renew your mind, it will never manifest in your physical body. Your body will experience what you think. And if you think on how sick you are and how poor you are and how depressed you are, then you just amplify all of these negatives in your life and they begin to start dominating and controlling you. But if you could start taking the Word of God and amplifying what the Word says about you in the Spirit and focusing on who you are and pray this prayer. What a great prayer. All you got to do is just put your name in there instead of saying, I pray that you would get the eyes of your understanding enlightened. Say, Father, I'm praying that my eyes would be enlightened. I'm pray- I've done this hundreds of times. I put my name in there. Father, I'm praying that Andrew Womack knows the exceeding greatness of your power. Paul prayed it. I'm in agreement. I'm praying, God, I receive this revelation. That's all you got to do. God wants you to know this more than you want to know it. And so just open yourself up and begin to pray this and start seeking it. And you can't get in the spirit realm and live there without the Word of God. Jesus said, John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's Word is spirit. You will default. It's your default setting to go carnal. You just by nature are carnal. You are going to look and go by what you feel and what you see more than by what you believe if you don't put some effort into it. And the Word of God, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you will take the Word of God and stick your nose in it and study it, it will start focusing you on what you have in Christ. It will focus on you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead and it will change you from being carnal to being spiritual. The Word of God will focus you on things. You know, I recently went to Gettysburg and I saw some things and then I bought a book about Robert E. Lee and I read it and it was very interesting but I was so disappointed in one sense because I'm used to reading the Bible. And in the Bible, you read these battles in the Old Testament and it tells you that God was the one that caused them to hear a sound like there were soldiers and so the whole Syrian army fled and left their tents and their food on the fire and it tells you what was going on in the unseen realm. But when I was reading this book about Lee, it just would tell about how that he had the advantage. He should have won and yet something would happen over here. And this person, the, the orders got messed up and they didn't follow through and somebody was late and they were delayed getting there. And I was just thinking to myself, I wonder what was going on in the spirit realm. Was that God that caused this? Was it God that caused this message to not be delivered? Did this person do that? And you know, when you just read a book, you're only getting the natural things. You can see what's happening, but you don't know what's going on in the unseen realm to, to do it. The Word of God shows you why things happen the way they happen in the natural realm. It's showing you what's going on in the spiritual realm. And I tell you, I just love the Bible because it gives you the spirit behind it. It it brings you into the spirit realm. It lets you see things from God's perspective and not just a human perspective. Nothing else is like the Bible. No other movie, no other book, nothing else brings you into the spirit realms and shows you what's going on and why this happened and why people are the way that they are. I tell you, I don't know any other way to be in the spirit than to go through the Word of God. And there's a lot of people that are just, by default, going with the carnal and they don't receive the blessings of God because they just aren't spiritual, they aren't renewing their mind. They are stuck in the physical realm. And the truth is that you've already got everything. 
You're begging God to give you and do what He's already done. If God could be confused, God would be confused. I could just see Jesus saying, they're asking me to heal them. Didn't I say somewhere in there? Let's see, where I don't know, but someplace over there in Peter, didn't I say that by my stripes they were healed? Why are they asking me to do what I've already done? Oh God, would you bless me? Didn't I say that they're already blessed with all spiritual blessings? Oh God, prosper me. Didn't I say that I've already blessed them and I gave them power to get wealth? Everything you're asking for, God's Word says He's already done. And yet we spend all of this time asking God to do it instead of uh, receiving it, believing it, praising Him for it, and taking our authority and making things change. It's a totally different attitude. So that's what I'm going to minister on this week. Is talking about you've already got it. Amen. You've already got the power on the inside of you to raise Christ from the dead. If you believe that, you'd act different. You wouldn't come up to me and tell me how pitiful you are and how that God hadn't done anything. You might come up and say, I know God's done it. What's wrong with me? Well, I can help you there. I can help show you some things that you need to do and that you need to change your thinking. But man, when you have to, you want me to help you make God do something, that's where I have a disconnect with you. God's not your problem. He's already fixed everything. Father, we love You and we thank You for the Word of God. Thank You, Father, for these truths. I'm asking that just like this prayer that Paul prayed 2,000 years ago, Father, we're praying that You'd open up the eyes of our understanding, that You'd show us these things we'd see the exceeding greatness of the power that You've placed on the inside of us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And we're far above whatever problem it is that's come against us. Father, our power, greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. We're infinitely greater than whatever problem we're dealing with. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would take these truths and make them come alive to people and that we would start fighting from a position of victory instead of fighting to get victory. Thank You, Jesus. And Father, we just agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. And there's, there's a lot of things that we could do, but it's time for you to go get your kids. It's amazing. We've got all of these restraints, constraints, but praise God for those people that are working with your kids. They don't want to be there all afternoon and night. Amen. So if you got kids over there, go get your kids. But you know, if you aren't born again, or if you are born again, but don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to receive that. You know, I just read a thing on the internet. I've seen two or three things like this, but yesterday my nephew sent me something and I looked it up on the internet and it was uh, ABC's Nightline that did a report on speaking in tongues. And they had a medical doctor that has been researching this for years and he took this pastor and uh, did an MRI on his brain and had him sit there and start praying with his understanding. And so he was praying and asking for God to you know, direct these doctors and the nurses and everything. And he was praying. And they did an MRI as he prayed. And the frontal lobe of your brain, which controls speech, was very active. It lit up in this MRI. And then they told him to start praying in tongues. So he started praying in tongues and that frontal lobe went inactive. And it bears out what the Word of God says, that when you are speaking in tongues, it's not your brain speaking. It says it's your spirit that is praying. And, you know, Nightline is Nightline. They didn't just come out and say, it's good, go for it. But they did say that, you know what, all of the science bears out exactly what the Bible has to say, that it's your spirit, man, praying. And this is so important. We don't know how to pray with our little peanut brain. 
You know, everything I've been saying today was about who you are in the Spirit. And you've got all of this in Spirit. It's in the Spirit that you're perfect. It's in the Spirit that you have the mind of Christ. It's in the Spirit that you have this raising from the dead power. How do you activate that? How do you get it out of your spirit? Speaking in tongues is just like finding a light switch. And when you speak in tongues, boom, you turn it on and the Spirit starts gaining control and dominance. I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need power. When you go to speaking in tongues, this power, this raising from the dead power starts coming through you. You need that. So if there's anybody here today who isn't born again, or if you are born again, but if you don't have this baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, you need that. Is there anybody here who would say, that's me and I'd like to receive? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Anybody? Here's one over here. Anybody else? Here's another one. Anybody here? Here's another one. Praise God. We had, I think it was 45, somewhere around there, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit last night, four or five that were born again. But praise God, we don't want to miss anybody. You need this. You need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward and we want to pray with you and help you to receive. Just come forward right now and let us pray with you and help you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. This is great. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Again, I say to those of you watching by the internet that you know what? You can receive this at home. You don't have to be here. The Lord provided this for every single one of us and all we've got to do is just reach out and receive it. And if you'll follow the instructions we're giving, you can receive. Also, if you'll call in to our helpline, we have people at the phones right now. You can call and tell them that you prayed with me to receive the Holy Spirit. We'll give you a free book that will explain that and it'll help you to receive. Amen? Praise God. This is awesome. All right, before you can receive the Holy Spirit, you've got to be born again. You must be born again. Is there anybody up here who's not absolutely certain about whether or not you've already made Jesus your Lord? Here's one right here. Anybody else? I want to pray with you first and just make sure that Jesus has come into your life. Brother, how did you live so long without Jesus being your Lord? I bet it's been a rough, it's been a rough road, hasn't it? It wasn't easy at all. Man, God loves you, brother. He's going to change your life today. You're going to be a brand new man. Isn't that awesome? You ready? Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody else that needs to pray first and make sure that Jesus is your personal Savior? Anyone else? Are all the rest of you sure? I'm not trying to talk you out of it. You just got to be sure. Amen. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to lead you in a real simple prayer. And it's not magic. It's not like you just say these words and instantly it happens. The Bible says you have to believe it in your heart. But I'm going to say the words similar to what you need to say. And if you will repeat it after me and mean it in your heart, then I believe you're going to become a brand new person and God Himself is going to come live on the inside of you. Is that a good deal? That's a good deal. Yes, sir. You, you believe that? Amen. Let's everybody say this so that he won't feel like we're just listening to him. Say, Father, Father I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you now live in me. I believe that you now live in me. I am saved. I am saved. I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Right now. Right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you mean that, brother? Yes, sir. Well, welcome to the family. Awesome. You just got changed on the inside. Isn't that awesome? I got a book I'm going to give you that will explain things to you. There's more happened to you than what you understand right now. But in the Spirit, you're identical to Jesus. Just like I was talking about. Thank you. Isn't that awesome?
And now, every one of you is just like that in the Spirit. And the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what He created you for. So there's no way that God wouldn't give you the Holy Spirit. This is what He made you for. So we don't have to beg and plead and ask, will God do this? He wants to give you the Holy Spirit more than you want to receive it. So all we're going to do is just open up the doors of this temple a little bit and welcome the Holy Spirit to come in. And I can promise you God's going to come in. And then I'd like to ask our prayer ministers to come up here and these people are going to stand behind you and they're going to lay hands on you because in the Bible it says when the apostles laid hands on people that the Holy Spirit was given. He was released into their life. So we're going to open up our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to come and then they're going to lay hands on you and release this power into your life. And then, after they lay hands on you, I want you to quit asking God to give you the Holy Spirit and take a step of faith and thank Him that He did it. Just believe that He did it because He promised that He would. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So He promised. You ask, He'll give. So we're going to ask, they're going to lay hands on, and then I want you to quit asking and start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to start praying in tongues because the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 17, that when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks. So we're going to start thanking God for Him giving you the Holy Spirit by praying in tongues. And when we start praying in tongues, I want you to start praying in tongues with us. And I know some of you probably have questions like, how do you do it? What do you do? I've got a book that will explain it. I hadn't got time to explain everything right now. But if you're ready, you could speak in tongues right now. The number one thing that stops people, they think that the Holy Spirit's going to force you to talk. Take your mouth and make you talk. But the Bible says, Acts 2.4, that they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the inspiration. God inspires it, but He doesn't make you speak in tongues. You have to talk and by faith believe that God is inspiring it. Very similar to what I taught today. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. You ready? Are you going to receive the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I'm ready. Amen. Well, Father, I thank You that all of these now are born again. And Father, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we open up the doors of this temple and we welcome You, Holy Spirit, to come into every one of these lives. Take up Your dwelling place. Fill us with Your power. We ask for it and receive it now in Jesus' name. We lay hands on You and say, Receive the Holy Spirit now in the name of Jesus. We loose this power and anointing. And Father, thank You for sending Your Holy Spirit to indwell every one of these with Your power and with Your authority. We receive this gift of the Holy Spirit and believe that You're helping every single one now to pray in this language that comes from their spirit and not from their brain. Thank You, Father. Now those of you who know how to pray in tongues, let's just worship the Lord. Just start speaking in tongues right now so that they won't feel like we're listening to them. And as we speak in tongues, you speak in tongues with us. That's it. Many of them are already speaking in tongues. Just start speaking. You can't talk in tongues with your mouth closed. You've got to open your mouth and talk. You've got to make sounds and believe that the Holy Spirit's inspiring it. If you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear the person behind you saying, but that's their tongue. Your tongue will be unique to you you can't just copy another person, but it'll get you to talking. And once you start speaking, once you start making sounds, just continue to do it. Start speaking and don't worry about what it sounds like. When you start, it's kind of like a little baby. It may not be fluent, but boy, your parent, your heavenly father knows what you are saying. He is thrilled that you are talking to him out of your born again spirit, not out of your brain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Just speak. You're bypassing your brain and you're missing all of the doubt and the unbelief and you're letting the spirit man take control. Thank you, Father.
Rokeshi Taraba Robon Bamparanda. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Let me have your attention here. Just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It seems like nearly everyone. I think there might have only been one or two that wasn't speaking in tongues. But you know, when I first asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't speak in tongues because I was a Baptist and I'd been told that this was of the devil. And I was so fearful of it. I had so many questions. I just wouldn't let it happen. And it took me three and a half years to speak in tongues. I received the Holy Spirit when I first prayed, but I didn't speak in tongues. When I spoke in tongues, it was just like I got it all over again. So it is important that you speak in tongues. But I'm just wanting to assure you that the Lord promised He would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So I believe you did receive, but you need to go ahead and speak in tongues. And I've got a book that I wrote. I don't think anybody had more problems speaking in tongues than I did. Man, I've had I had quite a bit of problems. <laughs> well, no, you just you've only been waiting a short time, praise God. No, I've been waiting four years. Well, no problem. So anyway, I wrote my answers that the Lord gave me in this book. And if you would, I'd like you to follow Robert right here. And he's going to give you a free book. And if you have questions, they'll answer your questions, minister to you any way they can. But this is Robert right here in the blue shirt with his Bible up in the air. Go with him. He'll give you a free book. It'll explain salvation and it'll help you. You're welcome, brother. Praise God. Isn't this awesome? Let's praise God for all of these. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Again, this morning, we're going to have our prayer ministers down here. I know that there's some of you that need prayer. And I would encourage you to take what I said this morning about that you've already got it. You've got this raising from the dead power. You know, let me give you... I know that we've gone a little bit long here, but just a real quick illustration. My sister who taught third grade her students asked her one time about what's the point of laying on of hands because she taught them that you already had this same power on the inside. And you know, God gave her a real great illustration. She says it's like when your battery on your car dies. You got everything in that car to make it work, but you just don't have that spark to get it started. So what you do, you pull another car up and you put those jumper cables on and you bypass your dead battery and start the car off the other one. And so if your battery, your brain right here, hasn't yet released this power that's on the inside of you and therefore it can't get out into your body, come up here and let us lay our jumper cables on you, amen? <laughs> we'll bypass your brain and we'll take the power that's on the inside of us and get to your body that way, amen? But this doesn't negate the fact that you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You just got a loose wire that's keeping it from being transmitted, come down here and we'll lay hands on you and help you. Amen. So these are our prayer ministers. If any of you want prayer, uh, come forward and let us uh, lay hands on you and pray with you.
mà kia lại khiến đôi má của em thêm sầu Vì sao em đi gần đây lại lý trí Chẳng để lại anh khi nước mắt còn rơi Còn rơi Vì sao em đã vội quên đi bao câu hứa Mình còn cho nhau Quên đi bao nỗi đau mình dành Vì sao em đã vội quên đi những nơi hứa ngày nào Sai đủ mắt môi Anh như chỉ còn muốn em bên cạnh như em phố xa rồi Anh chỉ muốn em cạnh đây thôi Không muốn em ở bên đời Chỉ muốn em anh bên người oh, oh, oh. Người đã gỡ bữa đi xa Trong cơn mưa chiều vội vã Người đã bước bên anh Khi cơn mưa qua gần vội vã Chưa ta chúng con giữ nhau Chẳng để giữ lấy em khi cơn mưa về đến Và chẳng cần nhau khi anh với em cùng một đêm trôi Em ơi ta còn gì nữa đâu Một cơn mưa ngày hôm qua Ta còn lại gì nữa đâu ngày em